Good evening. And good morning to those of you watching online or listening on the radio. We're glad that uh, all of you are here and that you are joining us as well to be in the Lord's house and have him bless us with his word and his sacrament. Before we get started with our time of worship, there are a number of announcements to get to. Uh, despite what Herb may have told you on your way in, today is the last midweek service this summer. Uh, next week we will be back on our uh, two services on Sunday morning and none on Wednesday, Herb. So, uh, starting September 10th, we will be on our normal schedule, 8 and 10.30, education hour at 9.15. Also on September 10th, that'll be the kickoff for our Sunday school uh, a program. Uh, our, we will be installing our Sunday school teachers that day as we begin the new year, so uh, please keep them in your prayers as well. Uh, church cleaning is next Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, there will be a list provided as well as the supplies needed uh, to clean everything up. Uh, if you're able to be here next Wednesday, we would uh, love to see you and uh, I'm sure that the people in charge of, of uh, making sure that the church is clean would be happy for your help. There's a mission festival coming up for Trinity Ortonville on September 9th, starting at noon. Uh, that would be, that'd be a Saturday. I don't know if that's right or not. I have to double check that. There's a, a letter on the bulletin board out there. Double check. If you want to go, double check out there because I thought they said there was a, a meal at noon, but I could be wrong. Uh, anyway, if you're interested in going, in, in going to a mission fest at Trinity Ortonville, uh, you can um, see that announcement out there and double check on the date. I have September 9th, but uh, it, could be, uh, it could be the 10th. All right, Minnesota North District LLL will be hosting their convention this year here at St. Mark's on Saturday, September 23rd, starting at 10 o'clock in the morning with registration at 9.30. Uh, Reverend Dr. Michael Ziegler will be here to be our keynote speaker, and he will be here to talk about being gifted for more. If you'd like to attend, the cost is $15, and that will uh, help cover the cost of lunch that day. Uh, LWML is collecting mites after today's service. You may have seen that on your way in. Today's order of service is Divine Service Setting 3. We do celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, uh, and our opening hymn is hymn 837, Lift High the Cross. May God bless our time of worship as we receive his word and sacrament.
Once again, our order of service is divine service, setting three, which begins on page 184 in the front part of your hymnals. We begin now by remembering our baptisms with these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The intro for today is Psalm 26. It is printed out for you in your bulletins so that we can read it now responsively. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without waver. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence, and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud, and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house, and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices, and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity, stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. We turn back now in the hymnal to page 186 and continue with the Gloria Patri and Kyrie. to God on high.
with you. Let us pray. O Almighty God, whom to know is everlasting life, grant us without all doubt to know that your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life, that following his steps we may steadfastly walk in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading appointed for today comes from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 15. O Lord, you know. Remember me and visit me and take vengeance for me on my persecutors. In your forbearance, take me not away. Know that for your sake I bear reproach. Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. I did not sit in the company of revelers, nor did I rejoice. I sat alone, because your hand was upon me, for you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unceasing, my wound incurable, refusing to be healed? Will you be to me like a deceitful brook, like waters that fail? Therefore thus says the Lord, If you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them. And I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Christians living in Rome, the 12th chapter. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise now for the reading of the gospel as we prepare for it by singing the Alleluia and verse. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, 
Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will, will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now make confession of our Christian faith by speaking the words of the Nicene Creed, which is on page 191. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God. substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We now continue by singing our next hymn, Drawn to the Cross Which Thou Hast Blessed, Hymn 560.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So said the Apostle Paul in today's epistle reading. And at first glance, it sounds like something that shouldn't be too difficult to do. Just live peaceably with others. Easy, right? But when we take a look around at the world around us, we see that things get more challenging. Now, of course, you could simply ignore all the sinful things that are going on, but then your love wouldn't be genuine, would it? After all, that is how Paul began today's New Testament reading, by telling us to let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Well, what does genuine love look like? Martin Luther had some interesting thoughts on that. He said that genuine love is bold, and it cares more about the eternal well-being of others than it does itself. It's not afraid to speak the truth, even if it's painful to those who need to hear it. But how many of us are willing to speak such truth to our friends and family, much less to our secular neighbors? We all know people that are greedy or in other ways selfish. We also might know people who are emotionally abusive or physically violent. Now, of course, we don't know what happens behind closed doors, but we certainly do know those people. We may not all know someone who is transgender or homosexual, but chances are we all know people who are adulterers. A vast majority of Americans, including many Christians, believe it is perfectly okay to have sex with anyone, anytime. Waiting until marriage is such an old-fashioned, outdated idea. So how are we supposed to love them with genuine love, abhorring what is evil and holding fast what is good, when people all around us are like that? Luther warned that it would be pretty easy to uh, be tempted to fake love them, which is, on the positive side, it would allow us to live peaceably with them. But then our love for them wouldn't be genuine. Either our love for them would only appear to be genuine, even though it isn't, or it would be a false love that would later be revealed to be false when tested by fire. Luther also said that folks might know that their love is fake, but they do it anyway to keep up appearances. Perhaps that's because it would be detrimental to them if they didn't. Think of the love or affection that a, an employee has for their boss. Even if they hate their boss, they're not going to let them know that. They have to pretend to care about them in order to keep their jobs. On the other hand, there are other folks who really do think that they love their friends and family until something happens that shows them the truth. For example, I might believe that I genuinely love my wife and children, and I think I do. And I might be able to convince myself of that until a criminal breaks in and holds our family hostage. Given the choice to save them or myself, which one would I choose? Now, of course, I'd like to think that I would choose to save them, but I'll never really know until my love for them is put to that kind of a test. Now, of course, all of us know there are people who choose to love themselves more than their kids all the time. They show it by the selfish choices that they make and the sinful things that they do. What Peter said to Jesus in today's gospel reading was a classic example of self-love. After Jesus told his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed and on the third day be raised, Peter immediately began to rebuke him. Now the word that Matthew used to describe rebuke, epitimon, was the same word that Matthew used when Jesus exercised demons. It is a strong, powerful word of intensity used to drive out even the most stubborn of demons. And here Matthew shows Peter using that same word to attempt to turn Jesus away from his earthly mission. He told Jesus, far be it from you, Lord, this will never happen to you. But 
was Peter really concerned about Jesus' well-being? Or was there perhaps another reason for Peter to say that? I think that based on Peter's actions elsewhere in the Gospels, it seems pretty clear that he was much more worried about Jesus' suffering and death about how it would affect him and the other disciples. As usual, all of them were more concerned about their own glory rather than Jesus's. You may recall how the disciples fought constantly over which one of them would be the greatest among them instead of which one would be the least. In Matthew 20, uh, the mother of James and John came to Jesus and asked him if her sons could sit at his right hand and his left in heaven. The other disciples were indignant when they saw that, presumably because they wanted to sit there too. To the best of my knowledge, none of the disciples were upset about the mother asking the question. They were just upset that they didn't get to ask that question first. That's how I think it is with Peter in today's gospel text. He's not worried about Jesus, although I'm sure he actually does care about him. But Peter's real concern was about himself and how the arrest and prosecution and execution of Jesus would affect Peter's own glory and reputation. Peter's idea of a Messiah did not have any place in it for a suffering servant, not to mention a suffering savior. The Messiah was supposed to be royal and powerful, not weak and mortal. Jesus confirmed that sad reality when he responded to Peter in kind, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. In other words, Jesus was telling him, You don't really love me, nor are you concerned about my well-being. You're only concerned about your own reputation. Then Jesus went on to tell all of the disciples what the true marks of discipleship were. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following me. Now, of course, it's worth remembering that to bear your cross does not mean any kind of suffering that you may have to endure. You might have all kinds of troubles in your life, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. He was specifically referring to the suffering that people endure for the sake of being his followers. That's something that until recently wasn't much of an issue for us here in America. But thanks to political decisions and cultural changes, we are gaining more and more opportunities to suffer for the sake of following Christ and being faithful to him. As I alluded to earlier, there are all kinds of people who are defying God's word and rejecting his will. But that's them. What about us? Are we somehow better than the other sinners we see? Now, of course, I'm tempted to say, yes, we are better because we're sorry for our sins. And as far as we can tell, they're not. But who gets the credit for that? When we have sorrow over our sins and we are repentant in our hearts, do we get the credit for that? Or is that something that's a gift from God? And if repentance really is a gift from God, then how can we try to claim any kind of recognition for that? The fact is, it is a gift from God, and therefore all the credit and all the glory should go to God. And even though we are forgiven, we still struggle with sins too. Is there ever such a thing as a good sin? Aren't all sins equally bad? It's a sim sinful temptation for us to try to compare ourselves to, to the sins that other people are committing. Lest we forget, all of us, including everyone sitting here tonight, all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. No one does good, not even one. That's why we need to remember what Paul wrote in today's New Testament reading. The true measure of a Christian is not what we have done for Christ, it's what he has done for us. That's the gospel message that's not in today's reading. In fact, it's not in chapters 9, 10, or 11 of the book of Romans either. There might be little sprinkles of it here or there, 
but the most recent mention of pure, genuine gospel is back in chapter 8. There God promises nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pretty much everything else from that point on was law. In other words, it was how we are supposed to respond to that wonderfully good news. We may talk about the suffering and death of Jesus, but that's not what we celebrate most. We rejoice in the fact that Jesus didn't stay dead. He did rise again, just as God said he would. And all throughout the Old Testament, that was always God's plan, that his innocent son would give his life for ours so that we might live eternally with him. But then his son would be raised up to life once more on the third day and show that his sacrifice was acceptable to God. That was the part of the message that Peter apparently didn't hear. He was so worried about what Jesus was going to suffer and his death and what that would mean that he didn't hear the rest of Jesus' statement. Yes, he would suffer and die, but he would also rise again on the third day. Jesus would indeed crush the head of the serpent, which is just what God the Father said he would do back in the Garden of Eden. When Jesus died on the cross, God's long-awaited promise was finally fulfilled. And because it was, that gives us the power and the desire to love others with genuine love. It enables us to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. That fulfilled promise motivates us to outdo others in showing honor, to be fervent in prayer, to rejoice in hope, to be patient in tribulation. Christ's accomplished work inspires us to bless those who persecute us, to live in harmony with one another, and to associate with the lowly. And yes, it even gives us the courage to overcome evil with good. You see, more than anything, that's how we can speak God's gospel to those who apparently have no use for it. Sure, we can condemn them as their sins deserve, but that's not how God treated us, is it? No. Instead, while we were still sinners, he showed his unbelievable love for us and worked through his word to change us from sinners into saints. And that's how we can live peaceably with others, by loving them with a genuine love, even though they don't deserve it, and letting God's work and his word guide us in all that we do for them. We have to remember, it's not our job to judge the sins of others. If they are unrepentant, then we should absolutely call them to repentance. And if they refuse to repent, then we should absolutely expel them from the fellowship of the saints. But that should never be the end of our efforts. If it is, we're falling short. Because even when others are excommunicated, we are supposed to be praying for them, that God's Spirit would work in them and change them to bring them to or back to faith in Christ and then be saved. And that really is the ultimate goal for us, isn't it? That our friends and family and even our secular neighbors would someday hear God's word and be saved by it? It certainly is God's goal for them. So I implore you to strive to love others with a genuine love so that God's will might be done among us and he might be glorified by us now and forevermore. Amen. At this time, the ushers will come forward and collect the offerings. This would be a great time to sign the fellowship pad as well.
Please rise as we join together in singing the offertory on page 193. Let us pray. O Lord, you have made us feast on your word to the delight of our hearts. Keep us from the worldly company of revelers who despise your word. Open wide our hearts to one another, especially those who are homeless or helpless. Let our love be genuine, our speech be truthful, and our patience ever constant. Let us be known for our love and without shame or fear serve one another. And inspire the pastors of your church to brazenly proclaim what is most precious, the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. Gracious Lord, we ask that you would preserve our nation, its leaders, and those who serve for the good of our people, including Joe, our president, Tim, our governor, Amy, Tina, Michelle, Paul, Tori, and all other elected officials, that they might live godly lives and serve faithfully in the offices to which you have called them, so that your will might be done among us and our citizens be protected and prosperous. Almighty God, we also thank you for others whom you have called into civic duty for our good, including police officers, firefighters, first responders, social workers, teachers and administrators, and those who serve in our military. We pray that you would bless them in their service, guide and encourage them to know and to do what is right, and keep them safe and joyful in all that they do. O oh, great physician, heal and restore those who cry out to you in their time of suffering and strain. We ask this especially for Beth, Ruth, Michelle, Stephen, Ron and Rosemary, Lydia, Madeline, Sarah, Connie, Marcel, Irene, Annette, Jerry, Tracy, Brad, Alyssa, Sheila, Diana, and David. Give to them your holy care and the strength to bear their crosses so that they may endure to see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Holy Spirit, as we joyfully remember the gifts that you bestowed on us at our baptisms, we especially rejoice with the saints who celebrate their baptismal birthdays this week, including Julie, Justin, Ruth, Leif, Sheila, Kellen, and Micah. May the blessings that you promised us in that sacrament continue to fill them and all of us with your joy and peace. O Lord, prepare us to receive the blessed gifts of our Lord's table, by which you preserve us as holy and blameless in Christ until he comes again. And finally, we ask that you would rise up and avenge those who are persecuted for the name of your son, Jesus. Likewise, grant endurance to those who need to bear their crosses for Christ as he bore his cross for us. All of these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue now at the service of the sacrament on page 194. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing...
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. stand and join together in singing the Nuke Diminis, which begins on page 199. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give to you his peace.
You may now be seated for our closing hymn, Christ Be My Leader, hymn 861.